Guys, we are here today because uh, we are committed to helping you here at Home Renovision to be the best renovator DIYer you can be. And so we figured we're going to bring on some experts into our channel. Roger is an expert. Uh, Roger, am I right in saying that you're a master plumber? I am a master plumber in Texas, not just a master plumber. I've got every master endorsement. So med gas, residential fire protection, water supply protection specialist, every bit of it. That whole mess. My goodness. Okay. Well, that's awesome. I know plumbing is one of those things, right? It's like when Neil Armstrong came back from being on the moon, they asked him, hey, what's it like to do something so important? important for humanity. And just being in that little space capsule, realize that plumbing was important is what Neil said. And uh, let's just face it. We don't have enough tradesmen nowadays. So as a homeowner, you're forced to do things yourself. We're here to help you. I've done some plumbing stuff on my channel. I can make water go downhill and I can bring water to a fixture. But today we want to talk to some experts, handle some questions that maybe are outside of my understanding. Let's face it. I'm from Canada. Roger's from the United States. We have different building codes different scenarios and different plumbing materials even. Uh, Roger, what are you what are you guys using down in Texas for plumbing water supply? Is it copper or CPVC or what are you up to? We don't use a lot of CPVC, mainly as copper. And okay. it, we're starting to get into PEX. And I say mm. starting to, in just the last few years, PEX has become more popular. I remember one of the first service calls I went out and did where I was rerouting a line over from, I was moving a kitchen sinks when I was done. Mm. Whenever I chipped up the floor, dug everything up and I got down to the water lines and there were PEX and I, was, I had everything there in copper ready to go. So it was like, oh, this is different. <laughs> but I've been doing commercial work for years, so I wasn't even used to it, but I figured it all out, made it happen, and it is still working today. There you go. Okay. So you're from Texas, so you got a lot of slab on grade. Mm-hmm which is great because that's not my experience. Listen, today is not about me versus Roger. This is about bringing all of my expertise from a four season climate with basements and all of Roger's expertise of being in a, a Southern climate with slab on grade, him from a licensed professional and me from a renovation contractor who hired professionals somewhere in the midst of all of our knowledge. If there's a question that can go unanswered today, it would be a miracle. I'm just being honest with you. I want to handle this one right out of the gate. Garbage disposals. Do you do those a lot where you are in Texas? Oh, almost every house in Texas has a garbage disposal. That blows my mind because where we are in Canada, we kind of frown on the idea of putting garbage in our plumbing system because it just slows everything down. Do you see this cooler right here behind me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's a garbage disposal mounted in the bottom of it <laughs> because we figured out how to make a redneck margarita machine. Okay. So you're right. Know, some of sometimes we have them in the offices too, not just at home. Nice, nice. Do you prefer pecs to sweating pipes? You know, I personally don't. I, I love copper, but then again, I'm an old school plumber. I started plumbing in 1980. I plumbed with copper for many, many years. Soldering, brazing, mm. here lately, you know, pro press, push to connect. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it, but there are some that work better than others. I'm just, I'm old school. I love copper, but PEX is starting to become more prevalent everywhere. Mm -hmm. I like the expansion PEX because it does not reduce the flow. If you put together a crimp fitting where you push it inside the pipe, it restricts tricks the flow. And I've, I've had problems with that. So unless so you're going to upsize it, I love copper. So what is the best way to run PEX if you're going to run it? Do you use a manifold or do you use a three quarter line and then branch off to half inch to each of your fixtures? I'd love to get your take on this. I think that if you're going to run PEX, I think you're good as long as you upsize it. Upsize at mm. one full size. If your code book calls for a three quarter inch supply line, run one inch because then your fittings are going to be about three quarter inch ID. Mm -hmm. That's going to keep you from losing any flow. Where it comes to be a problem is people running a water line. Say your water heater's at the back of the house, water comes in the front. So yep. you've stopped at multiple fixtures getting to your water heater. Now you've got multiple fittings and branches or, or manifolds or whatever coming back to your shower. Yep. Maybe a manifold is good in that point. I would still upsize it because of the flow restriction. That's interesting. So let me ask you about flow restriction then real oh. quick, because when I'm plumbing a shower and I'm using PEX, I don't worry about the PEX when the interior diameter of the, of the fitting and crimping, because our shower have got so much restriction in the water flow already for water conservation that it doesn't seem to have a negative effect. Do you have a different opinion or do you have a different system down where you're living? Again, it probably depends. For a manifold system, you're probably not going to have any problem at all. Mm. But if you take that three-quarter line and you go through 20 or 30 different fittings that are restricting the flow, you may not have a problem if the shower is the only thing you're running, Jeff. But if the washing machine is running, the dishwasher is yes. running, right. and your kids are in the shower too, mm -hmm. now all of a sudden you may be the very end of the line. It's like, wait, 
where's all my water at? Right. You're just standing there with a dripping faucet on your head. I get it. Running in circles, trying to catch the water drops. Yes. So at the end of the day, it's not about perfect scenario. I'm the only person in the house using water. It's about what if there's one, two, or three things happening at the same time. Okay. That's great. Yep. You got much experience tracing water leaks, figuring out where the water comes into the house. Oh, that, that's our specialty. We, Is it really? Oh yeah. Slab leaks and leak detection. Cause on here we're slab on grade. Like we talked yep. about. Yeah. Slab leaks, it. leak detection are big for us. We're slab on grade. Huge. Yes. Big deal. And and generally if you're slab on grade and you got water at your floor and not in your ceiling, it's coming from underneath. Yes, you're right. <laughs> you're right. It's got a 150 year old house. Copper was put in during the fifties. If he replaces with all pecs, can he just follow the original lines, new schematic needed? I like your advice. Listen, just run three quarter or maybe one inch, maybe a one inch feed line as far as you can and then branch off to the individuals because you, it takes less. If you run a manifold, you got to run thousands of feet of pecs. But if you just run a one inch supply line and run three quarter to the bathroom and then half to each fixture off of that, then generally speaking, you're, you're reducing your risk of not having enough volume. And that's really the issue, isn't it? Yeah, you're, you're not affecting pressure at all. Pressure right. is going to be the same no matter what size you run it. Yeah. I, I love that. You're supplying the volume to where even if there are multiple fixtures open, you're never going to have a problem. And that kind of advice only holds true depending on the size of the water supply to the house. Mm -hmm. What is the standard water supply size to the house down where you're from? Three quarter inch. It's yeah. three quarter inch yard service is normal. Yep. The meters are five eighths or three quarters, somewhere around in there. So mm -hmm. that'll work perfect. So going to three quarters is just a great start and use that as a main branch. Think of it like a HVAC system where you got a three quarter running the whole length of the house and every fixture is running a half inch off that or a three quarter off that to a room would be even more ideal. Then you're going to a bathroom and you're not going to have a shower and a toilet and a sink operating at the same time. But there's no downside to having more volume of water available. So if you're concerned about it at all, just upsize your pipe. It's pennies a glass. And like I say, when you're DIY and you're plumbing, you're making money every damn foot you're putting in. Yeah, think about this. It's not going to cost you that much more to go from three quarter to one inch. You're, you're buying the pipe anyway to replace it. It's yep. going to cost you pennies to upsize it. Do it. You're, you're going to enjoy it much more for a lot longer time. So how much galvanized or shall we say cast iron do you have in Texas? Okay, cast iron, we've got a ton of. We used to have galvanized because they, before copper, they ran the water lines and galvanized. It's all corroded. It's full. I mean, we've gone into houses that I'm surprised by looking at the pipe, water ever even went through it. <laughs> but for the drain lines, cast iron, we've got under all the houses. That's part of why I'm wanting to build a training center to teach plumbers how to not just use a camera, but use test balls and hoses to get in and isolate the system to find out where problems are exactly at. A lot of plumbers are are just walking in saying we need to replace everything and what we mm. do here with the house's slab on grade jeff we've got black clay here we literally dig tunnels and go in and just replace everything see well, like when i'm renovating an old house and i love it that's why i moved to ottawa because we have houses built uh turn of the century like the 19th not the 20th <laughs> and they were all built with uh, granite foundation and in southern ontario where i'm from they were all built with limestone foundation so the houses themselves were deteriorating at the foundation point and causing all kinds of decay but when I go to Ottawa, all the houses were just standing like they were built yesterday. But yeah, they had all these steel pipes, all the galvanized, all the problems that go with it. And it was amazing when you pull out an inch and a quarter drain line that's 100 years old, and there's just a pinhole for the water to go down. Like, you've got to replace that. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing is, though, if you can get a camera in there and show people, now, you, now they know why. And... Well, yeah, I get it. I did a video and I actually cut the pipes out of a lady's house and I just put the pipe into the camera. I said, see that? This is why you have to upgrade your plumbing. Yes. Because all that time ago, A, we didn't have building code and B, we had, hey, it's a pipe. Water moves down it. That's all we know. And that was the end of the science. Today, we know that we have corrosion issues. We've got sediment issues. We've got calcification issues. We've got all kinds of things growing in there and the world has changed. How much CPBC do you see fail and what environment slash why it fails. Down you here, don't see a lot of that, do you? No. The, about the only place that we use CPVC is coming off of a water heater. If okay. we can run the TMP line CPVC, mm -hmm. that's about it. When you get out into the country, a lot of times, if you find an older house that maybe the homeowner has done their own work, they mm -hmm. may do the hot water lines and CPVC, but I never see a lot of failure in CPVC on a water heater like that. So this is fascinating for me because I'm down here in Florida and for the first time in my life, we have 
see PVC. I've never had it. Never seen it. It was always copper or PEX. Like we build in Ontario, Canada with PEX exclusively for a long time now. Like it's been over a decade. Okay. But Jeff, you're working on a trailer, correct? Yeah. So I'm down here doing a trailer refit refit my butt. I'm actually gutting it and rebuilding it. <laughs> We're filming a new series, guys. Okay, it's going to start coming out in about a month or so, but I bought a double wide trailer and I'm renovating it all interior and exterior, bringing it brand new. It's from 1984 and we're going to make a brand new inside outside. We're expanding the living space outside and I'm on a $20,000 budget and I'm going to show you how much you can do with DIY. I'm telling you right now, you can double the value of your home doing DIY and we're going to prove it to you in the series, but we have CBPC down here and it's like this this is some good quality plumbing. I mean, you've got a primer, you've got a solvent. There's just no reason why that should fail. Now, as long as you've got all your joints supported, there's mm -hmm. no reason CPVC should fail over time. One of the big leak detection jobs I got was for a trailer park community. Some of these communities have three, 400 homes and they would have me come in at night. They knew that they were losing water. They didn't know where. So I would crawl under all these trailers, single wide, double wide, whatever it is, the middle of the night, because you don't want anybody running water. So mm. I'd come in at 10 o'clock at night to about 637 in the morning, crawl <laughs> under. Now imagine what kind of critters are hanging out under these trailers. That's not the time to be under a trailer. <laughs> no, it's not. But, but you can't do it during the day when people are doing laundry and running dishes. and all yeah, kinds yeah. of stuff going on. Oh, eh? yeah. I've climbed under there and seen bigger eyeballs than mine and crawled right back out. It's like, you know I'll what? I'll tell you right now. Yeah. When I got this house, I wanted to do an inspection under the trailer. I moved a couple couple of the bricks and I put my head under there after I put my flashlight in. I was paranoid because it's like, you know, down here they have a saying in Florida, it's um, a red and yellow kill a fella. You actually got poisonous snakes down here. <laughs> it's like freaked me out, right? Like where I'm from, if it's poisonous, it rattles first, but down here, no, it's a stealth attack. Anyway, <laughs> I stuck my head under there and took a quick look around long enough to realize that this trailer had been in position so long that the kind of grass that grows here in Florida, it had raised the elevation of the earth about eight inches from what it was originally. And there was no way I was getting my belly through that yeah. hole to go inspect anything. So I had a good look and I was like, okay, that's it. Enough for me. Place looks pretty solid. And uh, yeah, that was that was the end of that. Now, listen, I got a question for you, Roger, because you we got a community here of DIYers. Can homeowners pull permits to do work in Texas? Yes, they can. Matter of fact, in Texas, you can do any work on your house, any plumbing work. Now, electrical H HVAC may be a little bit different, but any plumbing work you're allowed to do if this is your homestead. If you've got it registered with the tax office, this is not just a home I own. I live here. This is my mm. residence. You've got that listed. You're allowed to do anything a plumber can do. Anything. Work on your gas line, work on your water line, work on your sewer line, change any fixtures, any appliances, including a water heater. You have to pull a permit just like a plumber does. Sure. The inspector's going to come out. He's going to inspect it. He's going to give you a green tag if you did things right. He's going to mm -hmm. give you a red tag if you did things wrong. And normally he'll be nice enough to tell you how to fix it. Inspectors are our friends, right? They are. Like, especially as a homeowner. I've never had a scenario where an inspector came out and said, you did this wrong and I'm not telling you what's wrong. <laughs> yeah, you figure it out. <laughs> right? Just, I'm going to give go, you a red tag, you figure out why. Right. And I, yes. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. That's not how they operate. Especially nowadays when we're short on trades, more mm -hmm. and more homeowners are pulling their own permit. And I think, like for instance, down here in Florida, things are different. Where I am from in Ontario, there's a lot more leniency when it comes to working in your own house. And we have a rule here. If you don't have to move a P-trap, you don't need a permit because now your venting and drain and everything is still in the same condition as it was before. So if you have to move your drain after the P-trap a little bit, there are products out there now for custom showers where you can take the drain after the P-trap and redirect it to a different location in your shower, build up, add a curb, do a custom walk-in. All this kind of stuff exists, but there's no permit for that because you go, you had a shower drain or a tub drain, you're doing a shower or a tub. Florida's cool with that. But every Every state is different. Yes, they are. At the end of the day, there's no way I can make 52 videos on how to build the same shower. So guys, if you're watching and you want to do plumbing, contact your local building office and find out what the rules and regs are. Getting information on internet or websites might be very convoluted and might be yesterday because they could have voted a new policy for a city tomorrow and every county has got its own rules. It's absolutely amazing. So at the end of the day, we're going to do the best we can to show you how to do stuff, but it's up to you to figure out if you're allowed to do stuff. And even down here,
here in the United States, Jeff, you've got the UPC, the Uniform Plumbing Code. You've yes. got the IPC, the International Plumbing Code. Right. And you've got to know which code your city, state, or jurisdiction, wherever you live in, what they're going by. But not only the codes, you've also got to check with each city and find out what addendums they have made. What I did love they that like? word, addendum. Yeah. That's just like secretly trying yeah. to do you in. Yeah, I know. My kingdom for a world where you could just fix your house and nobody gives a rip. That doesn't happen. Not to say that people don't, but, you know, if you want to sell your house, depending on this, the condition of the market, you know, following codes, having permits, having inspections, these are very, very important things. Two years ago, you could have sold your house if you did it yourself from A to B, wired it, plumbed it, did your own structural engineering. No one would have given a rip. They would have given you cash on the spot. They would have just bought it up, scooped it. It's available. I'm buying it. It's pretty. But the market has changed in a heartbeat. And now if you're going to go buy a house and you don't have your permits in place and you've got new work, they're going to check it out. They're going to take their sweet time. They're going to do their due diligence and they're going to go, I'm not buying your house because you broke the rules. You know, this is a lesson to be out there. If you're going to do DIY, do it yourself, but do it on a permit. Here's what I like about that, Jeff. We deal with a lot of houses where somebody who has done a flip, you know, people are buying houses, flipping them right and left these days. We'll get called by a real estate agent. Hey, I've got a buyer. They want an inspection. They want a plumber to come look at it, do a sewer water test, whatever it is. And we'll walk through and I think these flippers are doing the work themselves. They're not even putting a P-trap in, coming out nanning straight back <laughs> into the wall. And I just right. tell the people, man, be glad you called a plumber because a lot of people don't catch this. I've had home inspectors not even catch that. And it's like, you know, man, if you're going to do something, do it right, get it permitted. If you're buying a house, make sure that the work was done and permitted correctly. It really is a big deal. Yeah. If you're going to look at buying a house that's been flipped already, don't get wowed by the new car smell. Okay. It's called off gases. That doesn't mean that everything is done right. Stu has got a question here. He goes, at what height inside the walls to run plumbing lines? I'm assuming you mean horizontally. Roger, is there a code or is there a standard or do plumbers just say, hey, here's best practice? Mm -hmm. for running horizontal water lines in, let's say, a bathroom. Say we want to put an air chamber, a shock arrest or anything like that above it. Normally, we'll come out, run the water lines, say, at maybe 12 inches, 90 up, steep, put a T out, stub mm -hmm. up. That way, you can put an air chamber above it. Yep. Now they're, nowadays, they're saying, like, the air chambers really don't work. Eventually, the water will get up there. But, you know, that's the way that I was taught. Right, and PEX is different than copper. So, like, you know, I've had plumbers tell me that we don't even need air chambers with PEX because it expands. Eh, that might be a little bit hokey, but who knows? <laughs> well, and, and I mean, if you run soft copper, it'll expand a little bit, depending on how much pressure you've got. So well, yeah, and, <laughs> hopefully you, know, you don't have that much pressure. So I had an experience, Roger, you're going to love this. I had a plumber uh, working on a project who went horizontally at around 34 inches from the sink to the toilet. And wouldn't you know, we mounted a wall mounted sink. So Friday, the sink was mounted and there was no metal plate put on that stud. Mistake number one. And so, and this is not my, I was not managing that project. That just happened to be around when this happened. <laughs> okay. It's like clarity. It's Monday morning, we come back to the project and somewhere in the neighborhood of about a thousand gallons of water had worked its way through that house. And this was on the third floor of a three story, three unit renovation. So every ceiling, every floor, every interior wall had to be gutted and ripped out. And we started from scratch because of a six cent screw went through a water line that didn't have a 10 cent plate. Yeah, that, that's a, that, that's a painful one. <laughs> Some things you learn the hard way. <laughs> that's a yeah. painful one. So I love the 12 inch rule because nobody's mounting anything at 12 inches. I, I love it. And, and that's part of my reason why I literally love to come over, get over, go up to where I want to go. Say I bring my water line up behind a lavatory and I'm mm. not looping it up behind the toilet, behind the tub. I can come up under that lavatory, tee across at 12 inches, come up. I can yep. tee out for the lavatory and still go up, get an air chamber if I want it. Now I can run my line over to the toilet if it's a cold line, yep. drop down to come out at four, four and a half inches, Boom. six inches, wherever I want. Go I over, like continue up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. give yourself like up enough. Six. Depending on Never what kind of a Never have a problem toilet. with the baseboard. I yeah. hate cutting baseboards around toilet lines. Oh Absol goodness. Absolutely. Oh. Uh, and, and these days too, know what kind of toilet you're putting in. We actually went out to do a video the other day installing a new toilet. It was a Toto and the back of the toilet came further back than normal and actually had a curvature on it. I've had this problem. Yeah. And your water line's in the way. So we didn't actually get to install it because it was just a toilet install yeah. video and I didn't want to tear open the wall just to do a no. video. <laughs> Be careful when you purchase a toilet. If it costs more than your car, 
<laughs> they, and they, they, some of them can and, and these some days. Some of them do. And you might want to take a look at the specs for your rough-in. The same way we do specs for the rough-in for a gas supply line for a stove. Because these gas stoves have got a cavity for the supply line and the shutoff valve built into the back of the stove. These toilets, you got to have your water supply specific to the toilet, some of them. And they're a real pain in the butt. So check for clearance, take a look at pictures, look at it in a showroom. But yeah, I know it's frustrating. So these, everybody wants to make a toilet sexy. There's nothing sexy about a toilet. Uh, now, Can I, I just say? I, I, I don't know, Jeff, I got to be honest with you. I've got a bidet toilet seat on mine. <laughs> and that warm seat and that warm water, it, it, it's kind of sexy sometimes. I just got to tell uh, you. Fair enough. And listen, I'm just saying <laughs> the best toilet that I've got on the market, I get for 150 bucks. Okay. It's comfort height and it's soft clothes and it looks like a toilet, but I never have a problem installing it and is never, ever clogged because it's got the largest trap size in the industry and it has an instant siphon when you flush. So why would, would you, why, why, why? Like, why do we break from that? Like, why are there 8,000 different models of toilets out there? I don't have any idea. And, and worse uh, than that, now, why is there a thousand different ways to install them? You, you know, they, yeah. they've got the holes on the side where you've got to reach in. There's, there's a mechanical. Those stupid traps, those slimline toilets, and they've got plastic bet. parts and little knobs. And yeah, it's just insane. How should I troubleshoot a slow flushing toilet? You, you know, first of all, raise your flapper, reach inside, pull it up all the way. See, does it flush very clearly, mm. very quickly, like it should, if your flapper's not even there? That's if a great, great piece of advice right there. It, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to start because now you know you're getting full flow. It could be your fill valve not filling with enough water. Mm -hmm. So look at your water level. Has it come lower and lower and lower? Maybe the fill valve needs to be adjusted. Take the flapper up on the flush valve, mm -hmm. let it completely drain your tank, and watch your bowl. Does it go down like it should there could be a slight clog in there the holes on the bottom side of your ring they could be clogged there's different ways to clean those out how old is the toilet calcium and magnesium builds up in that ring under the seat just like it does everywhere else water comes out here's another thing i got some personal advice in a lot of places where people have done remodeling and they've mm -hmm. added layers to their floor they've added flange kits right to extend the flange and they've done stupid things and they did it themselves and they bought a double size wax ring and then they put the toilet in, they set it down and they squeezed it over to the right or something. And they've got all that wax sitting there. So now you've got this beautiful three inch hole that's half covered in wax. So if you lift the flapper and you give that, that structure the maximum capacity and it's still not working, pull the toilet. Cause I'll guarantee you there's something wrong with what's going on underneath. Nine out of 10 problems we've had with toilets and leaks and problems is the assembly it has nothing to do with the toilet. It's all of the in-between stuff. That, that's why I say start pulling the flapper. That gives you full yeah. flush. But also we've seen kids flush things down in toilets that get stuck. <laughs> Just going to throw that out there. You need a camera, yeah. Yes, you do. Yeah. Wax ring or rubber slash silicone for a toilet? What, what, are you, what is your preference? You, you know, Mark, this is a great question. I, I'm old school. Uh, like I said, I started plumbing in 1980. I still use wax rings. I'm kind of like Jeff. I'm not a big fan of the double thick one. <laughs> you know, somebody comes in and adds three layers of tile and, and now you've got to do something. Yeah. Uh, the, the rubber kind, they're, they have a good story. And people say, look, they really don't leak. I'm just, I'm old school. I'm used to wax. I don't. You know, they say the big problem wax. Well, then you got to clean it up. Okay. You know, I clean up after myself every time I do a job anyway. That mm -hmm. really doesn't bother me. I know it doesn't leak. As long as the toilet's not wobbling at all, I'm never going to have a problem with it. Yeah. So here's here's my experience with this. If you have a, a foundation of a house that's, that's not moving around on you, mm -hmm. then wax is great. Um, in my experience with older homes, with foundations that are subject to frost and heave and things twist and move and crawl spaces, up in the northern climates, uh, the rubber ring actually makes sense because it'll expand and contract as the building moves. <laughs> Isn't that the craziest? I love but, that. And, and I've never thought about it, Jeff. That That's a good thing to think about. Even up here, and we don't have a lot of pier and beam houses. But there's some. Hmm. Most of our houses are slab on grade, so they never move. So I do. That's a good way to look at it. I like that. Yeah, there's a... Uh... There's something to learn from different situations, eh? Mm -hmm. um, Demurin, is it possible for two ceiling vent fans from two separate bathrooms right next to each other, able to effectively work through one vent on the roof? Trying to avoid a second vent. Okay, yeah, you know, I get this question a lot, Roger. We got two bathrooms. They're trying to basically run two lines and then a splitter and then share one gooseneck exhaust or something out the roof, right? Mm -hmm. Are, do you get involved with that as a plumber? Is that your expertise? Normally, no. Normally, that is 
an HVAC guy. They're going to come in and put in the dryer vent normally and yep. the fart fan vents. So <laughs> right, that's, that's what we call them down here, brother. That's what you call them, man. You bet. It. it is what that's it is. A, it's but, a little but, style. But but my thought is, you know, you, you get a bird up here building a bird nest in it. Now you turn on the fart fan over here. Yep. Your neighbor may be enjoying the, the value of your work. So, so this is the thing, right? So I've got this personal experience. In, in renovations, we don't call HVAC guys that run ducting for fans. It's generally the same schlep who's doing all the carpentry, the drywall, the subflooring, right? These are the guys doing it. And so what we found is people, they, they sell a, 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 um, a, like a TY galvanized pipe fitting at the Home Depot. And the problem with that is, is then connected to something else that's usually corrugated, that's bending and, and, and it's got a gooseneck and a neck and a 90 and a 90. It creates a backdraft. You've got the fart vent from one room emptying into the other room at like 10 or 20% capacity. And so you're now not just farts, but you're sharing humidity from one shower room to the next room. And you're not exhausting that humidity unless you've got a fan that's got a humidistat and that costs a few bucks. Consider the idea that if you're going to do something like that, you better have the integrity to install your own damper valve systems as well. One more protrusion through the roof doesn't mean a hill of beans. If it's done right, it's going to work. You've already got one, so you're, you're, not, you're not flooding your house already. Separate the darn thing and then have some, some confidence that your installation is going to work because I haven't seen a TY damper valve system on the market. Quick question before we go to Gotham here, what can a homeowner successfully accomplish in your own mind as a plumber versus when should they call for help? That's a million dollar question that's hard to answer. I get it. it. It's, it's really not. Everybody's got to know their own skill level. How mechanically inclined are they? How mm. good are they working with tools? And, you know, can they pivot? Meaning, hey, I was going to run it this way and, and I'm looking at, at Gotham's question there. So that made me think about it. You know, I mean, Jeff, you can probably do more than my mother could do. So if my mother called and said, hey, Roger, I'm thinking about changing out my water heater. Right. I'd say, mom, no, 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 stop. No, call somebody. Yeah, yeah step away from the water heater. Please get the warranty. Yeah, yeah, the, whatever you got to do, mom, please step away. <laughs> but Jeff, if you called and said, Roger, I'm thinking about changing out my water heater. What do you think? I said, dude, go for it. Give me a call if you need anything. Yeah. Your capabilities are a lot different than hers. I understand her. I appreciate that. It's, you're making me tingle inside. You, yeah. you, you know, but, 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 but I mean, Seriously, I've, I've seen what you do. Could you handle it? Absolutely. May you run into something where, man, I got a question. I'm not sure what to do about this. Part oh, here. sure. I got to Google once in a while or got to call you, an old trade friend or something, right? No, yeah. We all do. We all yeah, do. It's part of the learning curve. So, you know, yes, anybody can legally do anything to their plumbing system. Like we talked okay, about. Okay, now we're talking Texas now, right? Like if you yeah, join yeah, us late, yeah, you missed the whole. There you go. the whole. In Texas, <laughs> if it's your homestead, you can do anything on yes, permit. Yeah, there you go. It's so, same so, in Ontario. In Ontario, we can do anything on permit. Good. So Ontario, Canada, and Texas are very much the same, um, which is fascinating. Anyway, let's get to Gotham's question. Here's my thing. Oh, okay. Gotham, as, as long as you can turn off the water, you can disconnect the radiator, you can look at the connections and see if they're close to the same, maybe they're exactly the same, probably not. If not, can you reroute those water lines to get them to where the new connections are? Changing out a radiator is really easy. It's like changing out a water heater. Mm. Where is the water inlet? Where is the water outlet? And what kind of connections are they? Can right. you alter the pipe to that connection if need be? Right. Handled that pretty good, didn't I? Not bad. Kind of like I know a little bit about plumbing. You, you might be a plumber or something. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, uh, I got books. I got good books. You know, yeah. I was on a job once. It was rather interesting. It was an older house in Ottawa, uh, 1920. And it had a hot water heating system. Still radiators through the whole house. Um, and we were doing the bathroom. They wanted to add a hot water radiator towel warmer in the room. And so they bought it from Europe and they have different plumbing there. And you know what? Uh, it wasn't that tricky. Just had to make a couple of calls by a couple of adjustment fittings. And next thing you know, boom, I was putting in a European hot water towel rack system in a North American home in a, in a market where we barely have any hot water radiators at all. And it's not that hard. Really, it's just about knowing when to turn the water off before you open up a line. <laughs> Isn't that the biggest thing? Or even if it's if you're working on a toilet, know where to turn the water off outside in case the valve breaks, in case something happens. Right. That's one of the biggest tips that will save everybody headache and a lot of money. But here's the cool thing. Jeff, I just did a video the other day where we're nine in here about a combi and it's like, I want radiant heat under my floors in my bathroom now. I've wow. never done it, but man, the water heater 
the the boiler it was right there yeah yeah it makes it easy so yeah we can do anything that's what i try to tell people if you can look at it and say hey i want this i want a towel warmer from europe in my bathroom mm. then we can find a way to hook it up it's not hard to do no it's just mechanical it's all about it's all about um thread size id od and and how to make that conversion right because there's a couple of differences there if i have an existing laundry drain one and a half inch, which is vented down the line. Can I add a laundry sink 10 feet away to the laundry drain or let's siphon the P-trap? <laughs> Number one, the, the inch and a half drain. I, I don't like that. No, it's uh, not big enough for wet venting, is it? No, it's not. And even, you know, here in Texas, we run two inch up to the washing machine box. When did you guys change that code, Roger? Oh, God. Uh, I think I was doing that back in the 80s. Really? We just changed that in Canada like three years ago. Did you? Yeah, two uh, inches to the water, to the drain for the washer. And, and then again, that may have been the plumbers that originally taught me, mm. you know, because now that I'm thinking about it, I think the code was inch and a half because I always asked why they did that. Mm. The other one I don't understand is why a tub drain can be inch and a half, but a shower drain has to be two inch. Isn't that nutty? We're putting the same tub and shower valve in. Yeah, yeah. And even on the tub that has the inch and a half drain, you don't have to go through the shower head. You can open up the tub spout, which just pours water in it. But That's that one funny. can get the smaller drain. So, yeah. So in, in Canada, we have one and a half to both. But then we oh. have to put in an adapter to <laughs> the two inch at the because the fixture is made for the American plumbing. Company. You bet. You bet. <laughs> so, so here's the deal. I, I would not add, if you've got an existing laundry drain line. Okay. So, so it's not necessarily a washing machine laundry mm. drain which is vented down the line can i add a laundry sink 10 feet away if you're not you can probably do it and not have a problem with it with the vent further down i think you're going to get too far away from your vent i think it's yeah. going to cause you problems and it could cause you cause you to soften up the p-trap on the other one my my thing here is if you're moving a laundry sink 10 feet away that's at the extent of your clean out length like we we have 12 foot clean outs on these mm -hmm. lines and if you're moving your laundry sink that far away is it your intent to drain your washing machine into that laundry tub because if it is then maybe you really need to consider upgrading to two inch and get to that wet vent line because it's, it's like if you can see it and it's like then just upgrade it follow it back to where it joins up with yeah. the drain and, and update change out the your, center or whatever yeah update to two inch and, and look though he's not just talking about moving it he's adding another yeah. laundry sink so now right. you got two sinks on there. You, it may be smart to go ahead and come up to two inch. If you can even add a relief vent further in, go back and tie it in. That, that could save you some problems too. Here's one of the crazy things, because here we are giving you advice, and obviously you're not doing it on permit, or you'd already been told by the permit officer when you're pulling <laughs> it that you've done it wrong. So, <laughs> well, listen, not... when, it, when in doubt, all right, just oversize it. Yeah, that, that There's never a, a problem with going bigger, all right? So yes. if you're if the question is, eh, is it going to handle it? Eh. It's like, you know what? Sometimes you need a V8, not a V6. So just update the pipe and go bigger. And you won't have to worry about it because a two-inch water line can handle anything in the house except a toilet. Uh, 60 split foyer, Maryland. Main water spindle valve is leaking at the stem nut. Can I shut off at the curb and replace the innards with a new valve instead of desoldering? Possibly so. The first thing <laughs> is, if it's just a packing nut leaking, have you tried just tightening up just a little bit? Mm. A lot of times that can happen. And I don't mean just crank down on it, but I mean, as long as your valve's open and does the valve work, have you serviced it lately? Will it open and close? Will it shut off water to the house like it's supposed to? If it does, what I'd like to do is open it up, turn it about one full turn closed, take a wrench, Tighten that packing nut just a little bit. If you can shut off water prior to it, you can possibly undo that nut and replace the packing inside of it. That keeps you from having to solder in a new valve. So are we talking here about, um, because there's a couple of different valves in my mind. One of them, they have gaskets, right? Mm -hmm. and, and when open and close, there's two different gaskets. And sometimes these valves, they're open for so long that the other side of the, they just start to, right? <laughs> They're just, they're yes. not going to make it. They're not a quarter turn ball valve. There's a lot of old valves out there that have got gaskets that need to be replaced. Is that what this is we're talking about? They're calling it a spindle valve. I'm assuming this is either a gate valve or globe valve, something like that. So you guys are all talking plumber talk now. So you've lost me. <laughs> Is this is right at the water main going into the house? Uh, well, that's what they're saying. Uh, the main okay. water valve. So I'm assuming it's the one by the house, not at the meter, because the one at the okay. meter's on their side. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, there you go. 
Maybe. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, at least if it's you got the ability to turn off the water at the at the at the at the road, right? You can depressurize your line and you can take things apart and you're gonna replace whatever needs to be replaced. So, so that's so, a benefit. Jeff, before you get in this question, let me ask you that. Y'all's meters are out by the road, I'm assuming, like ours are here in Texas. Not a damn chance. No? Where's y'all's no. meters? In the house? Uh, they we run our water lines at least five feet below ground. <laughs> okay. Because our frost line is 48 inches. I get it. Uh, I get and it. so it comes in underneath our basement slab. And then we have a, a main shutoff valve in the basement. And then we have a water meeting, or like, a, like, a, like a meter. And then we have another shutoff valve in most cases above that. And um, yeah. So when we want to turn off the water, what we do is we go to our basement. And mm -hmm. we go to the wall of the home that's closest to the street. And then we just look around for wherever that valve is. <laughs> I, I love it I, th I think that's fantastic when i was down here in florida and i had to do some plumbing work here i opened up the little green box in the yard and all there was is mud and i'm thinking to myself how many years has it been since someone's turned this valve off yes. and i don't know what it looks like in there so i called the city up and said hey you guys want to come and clean this out because i got to turn off my water and i'm afraid i'm going to wreck something and sure enough there were there were all kinds of loose wires and control mechanisms and I'm just stuck in the dirt. And these guys, they knew what they were doing. They cleaned it all out. And I was like, wow, that is ridiculous. And he goes, well, every time it rains, it just washes it right back in here. And I'm like, okay, now it makes sense. Anyway, I got a toilet that rocks back and forth. Oh, well, you got more problems than you know about right there. And a slow flush. Would this be because of air getting into the system from the toilet flange? Yeah. No. <laughs> the more air no. you have in your system, the better it flushes. So that's a no. If it's rocking back and forth and it's a slow flush, I'll guarantee you it's a toilet install issue. Somebody didn't know how to install your toilet and they squeezed wax in the in, in the wrong spot. Or it could just be a really cheap toilet with a really good brand name on it. Or, or even <gasps> that, the flange itself. The yeah. flange itself could be old. There could be a leak. The, it could have maybe not been installed properly and water got out around that wax ring. Now right. the, the, the ring around it, the metal ring, is rotted and corroded. Yeah, you, you need to pull your toilet or have a plumber do it. Entirely up to you. There are so many places that you can have a restriction in the flow of water on a drain. If your house is before 1975 in Florida, you probably have a cast, cast plumbing. Now, most people understand that cast plumbing is not a solid pipe. It's a sectional pipe and there's wide ends and narrow ends and they just stick them together, sort of, all right? Okay. So in cast iron plumbing, <laughs> ca okay, cast iron yeah. plumbing is all across the United States. Okay, so this isn't just a Florida thing. It's, this no, is, no, this it, was this was standard for a long time. You bet. And, and when and they the, brought in building code in 74, 75, and they changed it, and they said, hey, everybody's got to go to something more modern, right? Oh, no. I, when I started plumbing in the 80s, we were still using cast iron here in Garland. No kidding. Oh, wow. yeah. And, and okay. it's funny, Jeff, because that's one of the first things I remember from being on this particular job, and I was still an apprentice. I remember the inspector saying Garland will never go to PVC because it's unproven, it's untested, and we know cast iron will last forever. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know what? Forever does not hold the true. So here's the deal. Yeah. The wonderful thing about cast iron, every joint is kind of sealed. and as water runs through and things corrode, it seals up. That's how that works. But if you got a tree anywhere in your vicinity, those roots are looking for water supply and they're going to find their way through that joint. And they're going to go from a one inch thick root down to a nanometer and then show up in your pipe and go back to one inch again and grow a tree of roots right there on your water pipe. And that's how they're going to operate. You could have a problem with your toilet that's not your toilet. It's not your plumbing. It's not your extensions. It's it's not the plumbing in the house. It's not the plumbing under the slab. It's the plumbing from the slab to the street. At the end of the day, the toilet moves a lot of water real quickly. The only other thing in the house that moves water that fast is your washing machine. So if, if that's having problems backing up as well, then maybe you should take a look down the line and get somebody in there with a camera and inspect it. But um, if your washing machine is working fine and your toilet's slow... <sighs> Yeah, it's probably a toilet problem. How have the advances in tankless water heaters changed? And are they now worth it over the classic tanks? Worth it, I mean, as far as the investment, I imagine. I know my answer. T tell me what you think. Well, I remember when they first came out. Um, any we anytime we installed them too close to the fixture, we had problems making hot water. There was there was something about the flow rate with proximity to the tank that we had issues with here in Canada. I know it's it's fascinating, but we couldn't understand it. But every time we had a, a, a one of these like on-demand water water heaters that was within six feet of a bathroom, the shower never got hot. It would just switch back to cold all the time on a regular basis. And there's probably a sensor issue. Um, so we just learned as renovators to move them further away. For whatever reason, it worked. 
Wow. <laughs> and, and, and for whatever reason, I hated them because of that, because <laughs> I could not deliver a consistent result. And so I steered clear of them for a long time. Well, here, here's my experience. And I think that they are getting better. I think they're getting a lot better, to be honest, mm. because number one, as long as your plumber or you, if you're doing it yourself, does a gas load calculation chart, meaning you know how many BTUs your systems are using, you know everything you need to know about your system and make sure your current gas system can handle the load of a tankless. A tankless water heater has to be 199,000 BTUs or lower. Once it goes over 200,000, it's a boiler. Yes. Whole different set of rules. Mm -hmm. A normal tank top water heater is 40 to 50,000, really 30 to 50,000 BTUs, depending on the size of it. So think about this. You're going from a 50,000 BTUs to almost 200,000 BTUs. Most gas meters aren't regulated or big enough to carry that much gas. Mm depending on what you've got installed. So the first thing you need to make sure is you need to do a gas load calculation chart to make sure you've got a big enough gas line from where it comes in at your meter through your house to where the tankless heater is going to go. Start with that. The vents are getting easier. You can now vent most tankless water heaters in PVC or Centrotherm, which is a product that has a metal lining in it. Mm -hmm. so a lot of different things you can do, but yeah, I think that they are, the advances are phenomenal. I spoke at KBiz about these new tankless heaters that have memory. So they're learning your usage habits. They put a comfort fitting in at the furthest point. It can circulate water to make sure you have hot water circulating in your line before you ever get that's, in your That's child. a really big issue too. Right it really there. is. Yeah, really is. Having circulation in a line like that, it makes all the difference. And mm -hmm. I think that's where we were running into problems because uh, let's just face it. In Canada, we were using flow restriction, everything in a bathroom. And so the water's hardly even moving. <laughs> and so the tank is going, am I on? Am I off? I don't know. I'm confused. It's having an identity crisis really mm -hmm. is what it was. <laughs> so by having that, having that flow, um, you know, like recirculation system. Yep kept the water moving so it kept the tank on and i think that ended up being the solution the only other thing i'll say about these tankless systems is this um my advice from my gas guy last year and this has probably changed because you know the world's gotten more normal don't put in a tankless system because there are so many different systems and so many different parts and no one's keeping parts in stock so when it fails it takes weeks if not months to get replacement parts because everybody is trying to get into this game and they're always changing their specs and they're not keeping stock on parts for repairs and so i thought that was really interesting insight coming from a gas tech it, are things more normalized are they more standard now like you can't put a chevy engine into a ford i get it but you know at least if, if you've got an issue with most plumbing you can go down to your local building store and you can pick up a fitting is it, what's it like out there roger it's getting better you know we went through the big freeze that made it all the way down to texas a couple of years ago and at that <laughs> Point. You couldn't yeah. get parts for anything. Yeah, I know. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. You bet. Yeah, yeah. We, we tried to send it all up to y'all. Is the crimping tool for copper lines just as secure as soldering? What tool is best? Is there a crimping tool for copper? Well, uh, I'm assuming that she means either for pro press, you know, because because they've, they've got the crimp fittings now. Yeah. Uh, that That's the only one that I can think of. Is it just as secure as soldering? No. We, we've actually got, we built a blast chamber out here so we can, well, I, can I mean, I can, I've got a 10,000 PSI hydrostatic pump so we mm -hmm. can blow stuff up and, and I love it. That's it's, fun. It, it's all plumbing. Yeah. So we stick pops in, <laughs> pump it up and, and see what happens. And we did this because of a sponsor. Uh, yeah. we, we wanted to test their product, make sure it held like they said. Nice. Look, it, it primp, none of it. Push to connect. PEX, it doesn't hold like solder. We cannot even get a solder joint to blow apart, even up to 10,000 PSI. So right. it, it's the, the copper will blow a hole in it, the cap on the end, anything will blow apart except for the solder joint. So is it as strong as? No, nothing's ever going to be. Does it need to be that strong it doesn't. in most it doesn't. situations, right? That's the other question, though. No. Like, it, it, it doesn't. Yeah. When, when, when we come down to it, people want to know what's the best. Mm -hmm. Right. And the answer is, um, how good are you at soldering? And if you're not any good at soldering, then a good solid ring crimp tool for PEX is good. Expansion PEX tool for a, another couple hundred bucks is better. CPVC water supply lines is, is still great. At the end of the day, there's really no wrong answer. There's just different options, right? We're really talking Ford, Chevy, um, Dodge or, or GMC, like pick a truck. Like it really, as long as you 
install your plumbing with integrity because it all comes down to the installer, right? Then you're going to be fine with either of those options. They're all rated for a 50-year build. The question is, what's going to last longer at the end of the 50 years? And my answer always is sell the house after 45 and don't worry about it. <laughs> and, 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 hey, pull a permit and get it inspected and you know you as did it right. As, as long as somebody else says, hey, this is what needs to happen, then who really cares? All sure. right. He's got an 11 by 17 hole that he dug down and put four inches through quarter rock, compacted it down. I'm not poured slab yet, but this hole just fills with water. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, that's not really a plumbing question. It's not. The only thing you might be able to do is build like a sump pit area. Yeah. To where any water there has a place to go, and then you can pump that water to somewhere else. Really, at the end of the day, that's what it is. If you have groundwater underneath your slab, the only way to solve it is to dig a deeper hole and put a pump lower than the water line. And then it should evacuate that water to the point where you can you can move forward comfortably. Now, I know houses that are out here in Ontario, we get this all the time. And those some of those sump pits, they, they're running three or four hours a day. Like, it's not abnormal. But that's because they are fighting a battle that's so far down from anything that's affecting your house you know it's kind of like um if if the pump was another foot higher it might only run 10 minutes every day but we try to get as extreme with our approach to dealing with water in a foundation as we can because water is not your friend underneath your house <laughs> and that's just the way we work it so yeah if you have a one sump and it's working too hard, put in a second, all right? And then put in backup pumps in each of those lines as well and uh, whatever it takes. Because at the end of the day, two sump pumps with a backup pump in each of them in a house is still only going to cost you a thousand bucks. What's a thousand bucks? And can save consider, you a consider, fortune. Considering the alternative, right? It's yes. just, it's not even a question. It's, it's, it's why we give the boys in blue bulletproof vest because it's just worth it, even though they're expensive. Um, you know, we one question I want to ask before we're done. You bet. And this is the big debate. Copper versus plastic. I hear this comment all the time in my because I'm a big PEX fan because I'm an idiot when it comes to plumbing. So, you know, I, I love the convenience. Um, is there any truth to this rumor that the PEX is like toxic to the human being versus copper versus anything else? Is that something that your industry really pays attention to? I, I don't think most of us do. California's outlawed some pecs because they're like, look, it, it leaches chemicals into the water. I don't know if y'all know this. There's chemicals in the water anyway. Uh, yeah, last time I checked. You know, yeah. there's a there's a bunch of chemicals in the water. Yeah, yeah. Or the chemicals there's a little heroin, there's a little crack, there's it, a little it, bit it, of this yeah. and that. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, and, and everybody in the United States, that, that there's, what, what's that? there's a website, ewg.org, something like that. Okay. They can literally just go and put their zip code in yeah. and it will tell them all the contaminants in their water that are up. Uh, well, first of all, it'll tell you all the contaminants in your water. Then you can scroll down a little bit further. It'll tell you all the contaminants in your water that are above the recommended levels. Yes. One of the biggest ones that always come up is arsenic. Okay. Now, arsenic. Yeah, well, so, yeah, don't want some yeah, of that. Yeah. You know, that, yeah, that, that's up on, that's <laughs> high up on the list of things you don't want in your water. And right. my thing is, yeah. look, if that's allowed in the water from the city, what can the plastic pipe be putting in if it's any worse than that? Well, you know, I'm always thinking of if, if water quality is a concern, then get yourself a purification system underneath mm -hmm. your drinking water supply in your sink. Well, you and, and I'm going to, I'm going to take it further, Jeff. Yep. If you if your water is really that big of a problem, put in a whole house water filtration system. Yep, yep. Because your body absorbs those same chemicals when you're even in the shower. Yep. When that water runs on you, your body sucks the chlorine and magnesium and calcium and everything right out of it before that water ever hits the drain. Yep. If water quality is really a problem to you and you're really worried about the water you're putting in your mouth, be worried about the same water you bathe in. And think about a whole house water filtration system. At the end of the day, it's a ten thousand dollars solution. Yeah, and you can you can have zero parts per million, million water if you want it. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Uh, move on, because then you're going to just go out into the world. You're going to get in your car, drive down the street, and when's the last time you charge the air filter on the intake on your car? Like, <laughs> like there's so many places to get toxins. Listen, folks. At the end of the day, uh, nobody lives forever, so let's not make mountains out of molehills. But if you are concerned about water quality, you can fix it.